no matter who you are, how good you are, or how bad you think you are, the God of the universe wants to be known by you. And he stands at the door and knocks. This is our God. Think about this. God knew you before he formed you in your mother's womb, before you were even flesh. He knew everything about you before you breathed your first breath. And now, now that you're here living and breathing, the God of the universe desires so deeply to be close with you. This is our God. You see, God is fascinated with you. He is constantly pursuing you. He wants an intimate connection with you. He wants fellowship with you. And if you open your heart to him, he will speak life into you. This is our God. When life is tough, when jobs are lost, when marriage gets hard, when it seems like all hope is lost, the God of the universe is your protector and your shield. He is the sovereign one. He is the beginning and the end. And there is no curveball that he did not see coming. There is no storm so loud that he won't hear your cry. And God is always with you. He's the God that goes before you. He's the God that goes behind you. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He loved you so much. He gave his only son for you. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. And there is nothing you can do that can separate you from the love that the Father has for you. This is our God. He's not some distant thought or some unreachable object. He's here, he's alive right now. And his greatest desire is to know you, to walk with you, to live with you, to speak with you, to pour out his love on you. This is our God. And he is worthy to be praised. Amen, amen. Let the church say amen. There is something about the name of Jesus. There's something about the name of Jesus. Good morning, everybody. We'll uh, start with our call to worship. Uh, for those who are able, I want to encourage you if you could stand as we start with our call to worship. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. 
Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people, sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Uh, continue to join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from thence he shall come to judge uh, the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body in the life everlasting. Amen, amen, and amen. Uh, brothers and sisters, we're coming here on this uh, Pink Out Sunday to give God praise, to give God honor. I want to encourage you, if you can help me just by uh, giving a hand praise to the one who gave us this day. Let's give God a hand praise as our worship team lead us in worship. Hallelujah. God, we bless your name. Hallelujah. Oh. You are here, you're moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. work promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are we make miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are here touching every heart Worship, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship, I worship you. Oh, we make a.
Church, say amen again. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, both now and forevermore. Brothers and sisters, we want to make sure we say good morning to all of you. It's so good to see all of you uh, gathered here in this uh, community of faith as we come to give God honor and praise. We know God is doing a special thing in our midst and we want to make sure we just take the time to say good morning to you all those online we're so grateful that you're here uh, those online you'll see a button that pops up in the chat please uh, click that let us know that you are here uh, for those of you who are in person i want to encourage you if you could look on the back of your bulletin if you're a first time guest please just uh, You'll see a couple of things. You could scan a QR code, or you can text, uh, connect at a uh, number that you see there listed. We want to make sure we have an opportunity to connect with you. We know God is doing something special in our midst, and we just want to make sure that no one's left out. Amen? At this time, we want to encourage you, if you could stand and greet one another in the name of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. This may be the only time some energy that you have may go into someone else. Let's greet one another in the name of the Lord.
Amen, amen, amen. Before we let go, we want to make sure we say welcome, 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 welcome to everybody. So glad that you're here on this Pink Out Sunday. Uh, Y'all give a hand praise for uh, First Lady. Great morning, great morning. Since he's standing here, I don't know how this works. Arm? Arm? With the left arm. That's how you do it? There we go. Great morning, family. Great morning, church family and friends. Welcome to Pink Out Sunday. I've been pinking out all month. Y'all know if you've seen me, I've been in pink. I've been excited. Okay, you where you want to go? Which way you want to go? I can leave. Okay. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Great morning. I am excited to be here. As you know, y'all know every day is exciting. Every day is a new day, a new beginning, new mercies, a new opportunity to serve and to give and to praise the Lord God who kept me. He kept me. And Pastor Ed, Y'all saw what I put on him. My testimony today, because y'all know I have a wonderful testimony on this diagnosis, this journey, right? Um, And I'm saying journey as it continues because I'm learning this post journey, this after the diagnosis uh, journey. So I'm learning uh, some things. Um, In every prayer group that I've been on lately, Uh, We've been praying for caregivers. So this time, this testimony is publicly to all my caregivers, all the people who took care of me, all the people who gave me a meal or a lunch ticket or brought uh, some food over, or even when I requested the repeat of that, Tabitha, if you're listening, Miss Lillian, if you're listening, you know, I requested things again, like it was so yummy. I'm like, oh, can we get that again? Is that rude? Can you ask people to do something else again? Um, I'm so grateful. Any caregivers in the room, will you just wave your hand? Caregivers, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for... You better raise your hand. You taking care of kids. Yeah, thank the grandbabies. Come on. I sent you. Amen. (laughs) If you're caring for anyone else beyond yourself, you are a caregiver. Thank you. Thank you. And I today will say the names of my other caregivers, Elaine, Beatrice Molo. That's my mother. And my dad. So happy it's his birthday today, his heavenly birthday. Thank you for giving me life so that I can even stand here today. Um, Also, oldest daughter, hey, Tiffany and Mackenzie, I know y'all online. Uh, Asha, hey, Asha. And Aaliyah, Aaliyah Joy. They gave themselves their own titles in the journey. It was very interesting, okay? Y'all know I had the, the theme joy. So we journeyed through the journey of this cancer diagnosis. Two years, breast cancer free, by the way. Amen. (laughs) Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. And they gave themselves their own titles, who was doing what, who was in charge, who took care of the, the, I think there was a text or group thing that was going on, uh, the self-care daughter, the people who did the draining, the medication, all of it. So if you are a caregiver, you're so special. We cannot go through life alone. You matter. Everything you do matters. I am, I met some really neat people last Saturday and I don't see them here, but I'm gonna just tell you quickly, quickly. I was in awe already of how God kept me and healed me of how I processed through. However, I heard a testimony last Saturday at a um, breast cancer walk, and this young lady and her husband was by her side as well. She had similar diagnosis. No one has, no one goes through the 
may have some of the same titles of it, but the journey is never, ever the same. And her diagnosis was very similar to mine. And what I heard her say was, I had the double mastectomy and it failed. And I said, my mouth just went, and I continued to hear some of what she said because I was so grateful that God, not, I knew God, your prayers, I knew that I was healed and whole and pressing on. When I heard her say that, and she was still standing right there in the parking lot, had, had just finished the same walk I had done, three miles, by the way, y'all, we were walking. Praise you, Jesus. And I ain't going to say what happened next because I had another caregiver who was with me. And one of them is here back there. Um, so her testimony shifted me in that it failed. My diagnosis was during COVID. So y'all know what we were doing during COVID. That's why y'all see me in my mask. I'm just one of those permanent maskers because my diagnosis, it was traumatic to me. First of all, you have breast cancer, and then that is COVID, and people were going in the hospital with COVID and not coming out, or not even getting to the hospital, so y'all feel that part of that. She, she too, same thing, 13-hour surgery. I had a 12-hour surgery. I just was in awe, because when something went wrong in my hospital room, I looked up, my plastic surgeon was standing there at three o'clock in the morning, that's God. He's like, what happened? What's going on? I was like, uh, God kept me. I'm so very grateful that she was, she is still able to share her testimony, even in failure. I pray y'all getting that. I'm not preaching this morning. We have a great preacher. <laughs> y'all get it that God still still yeah. did that she was standing there saying to us and it failed but god kept her i'm so grateful for all of you for your <coughs> prayers your thoughts your continuous prayers your continuous positive thoughts you are definitely significant in our lives caregivers you rock caregivers you are the best. And I just publicly thank all of you for being that. And to all my survivors and thrivers, will you stand? Any survivor of any, any diagnosis. <laughs> yes, any. Come on, come on, come on. All right. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Keep smiling. Keep shining, keep thriving. Amen. Okay. Okay. Great. Now we're shifting, transitioning to prepare our hearts for our speaker of the hour. Y'all in for a treat. I didn't invite her. She was invited because we heard her speak. And our own Pastor Hilda is her friend. And we're so grateful that she's in the house. This is Dr. Susan Nichols. Susan is no stranger to overcoming adversity or the power of public speaking. From a young age, her authentic and transparent life testimony naturally drew people to her leading her to speak at collegiate events. It was during that time that Susan realized public speaking would be a vital platform for her purpose. Her passion for inspiring others took on a profound new meaning when she was diagnosed with a rare and, and aggressive form of cancer. Even while undergoing treatment, Susan and her family dedicated themselves to empowering, supporting, and educating their community about leukemia. With the unwavering support of her family and faithful friends, 
Susan found the hope and strength to endure multiple life-threatening complications in three years. Somebody say three years. Three years of intense chemo. Today, she celebrates 10 years in remission. A lifelong, amen, praise the Lord. A lifelong learner, Susan earned a bachelor's degree in human development and a fam and family studies from Texas Tech, any Texas Tech University alumni, okay? A master's in theology from uh, Houston Graduate School of Theology and a doctoral degree in transformational leadership from Bake Graduate University. Susan's story, Susan Nichols' story is one of resilience and purpose, and she communicates it in a way that honors her journey. Her message offers a powerful and unforgettable experience that will inspire others to change the world. Amen. After the song, I believe you will hear Dr. Susan Nichols. Amen.
Good morning. Don't mind, I'd like to pray before I get started. God, I just thank you for this privilege and this honor to be here this morning, God. I just ask that every word that come out of my mouth be glorifying to you. Lord, you know that you have been my sustainer. And I just thank you for this opportunity. In Christ's name, amen. So my name is Susan Nichols, and yes, there's a lot of connections here. I, first of all, I'm so honored to be here this morning. Uh, not only honored to be in this church, but honored for the connections. This is truly a God thing. <laughs> uh, so Hilda asked me to speak at the Lumen. I really put a very specific thing on my heart for a good month. So I worked on that for a good month. Didn't disclose to Helda what I was going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking to you this morning about miracles. Hallelujah. And Susan, do you know what I preached on last week? After uh, she found out what I was speaking about, and we just knew it was a God thing, an absolute God thing, one of those things that transcends all differences, you know. This morning that you will really see that and what I do. I'm going to kind of do this in two parts. I would like to share a little bit of my story with you because it will give you context. Um, to share a sermon with you. This is not unfamiliar to me. I have been and um, to all audiences, and so I just pastor for inviting me and we go back with first united Methodist downtown where my husband and i began our marriage together, and so a lot of great connections um may 30th of 2014 i'm going to disclose a little more than i did in my first talk um i have a dear friend I was in leadership at the time, just kind of getting to know each other. And he said, Susan, I would love for you to come because the UN ambassador from Burundi is going to be here to speak. And he's covering a lot of things that you and I have both had on our hearts and minds for our communities. And so I went to that um, service, not knowing the speaker, and he preached. And towards the end of that sermon, specifically came to me, looked at me and pointed at me, and God said, God has something very specific I'm to tell you. He is going to take this health crisis you're fixing to go through in the next 15 years to redefine what ministry looks like to you. So my immediate response was turning to my friend Phineas and saying, what have you told him about me? And he's like, nothing. I, ha I haven't said a word. At that time, I had actually been going through some health issues with my kidneys. I was born with a congenital um, kidney disease. And I thought, oh, well, praise God, at least five years of that is over. Because I was about five years into dealing with that. Fast forward uh, the month of August. We, as a family, had never been on a cruise before and chose to take our... Um, my niece that we helped raise for her 21st birthday on a cruise with our children. And during that time, I started not feeling very well and um, was showing some symptoms. At first, I thought, well, maybe this is my kidneys acting up. Uh, to the point where we were on a beach in Mexico one day, and my husband looks at me and says, I'm really concerned you look like my mother did about six months before she died. And I thought, that is a horrible thing to say to your wife. <laughs> like, just keep your mouth shut. And um, anyway, I was taken back to the, to the ship. They wanted to take me to the hospital in Mexico. I said, no, thank you. Please just get me back to the ship. I promise I will stay in bed. Um, and I, I didn't, I failed to say this is one of those cruises. I work with pastors for many, many years. That was my primary 
kind of sphere of influence throughout my career. And um, I was so happy to get away on a cruise, and I was like, God, thank you for giving me a break from pastors. So sorry. I, I was just at a point where I was like, ugh. And as I'm unpacking, I heard the voice of my pastor, like two doors down, it, it, the cabin adjacent to us. And I was like, okay, God, seriously? But came in handy. We get back to the ship. My pastor noticed I'm not feeling very well. And um, so him and his wife laid hands on me and were praying for me. Spent the rest of that trip in, in bed. Um, when we got home, um, got kind of home and settled. And on Sunday morning, we were at church. And I looked at my husband. And I said, I still am not feeling right. I'm, I can't shake this thing. So I think I need to go home. Um, let's forego the service this morning. So he took me home. By Monday morning, I um, called my primary care and said, they said, we can get you in this afternoon. And I said, I don't think I can wait. I'm going to go to an emergency clinic. Went to an emergency clinic. Um, they thought I was just having migraines. I was presenting with some headaches and some, some nauseousness. And so uh, they just pumped me up with some good pain meds and sent me home. Later that night, after those meds wore off, it was back with a vengeance. And I looked at my husband, and I said, I'm in the car when you're ready to take me to the ER. Um, it was the first time we had ever left our kids by our, themselves. We had an 11-year-old and a 10-year-old at the time. And um, my husband, when we got there, um, turned to the nurse and said, you need to do blood work. Um, there's something going on. You need to do blood work. Um, within an hour, I had the chief physician of the hospital standing over me saying, Susan, um, we got to admit you and start blood transfusions immediately. And um, so that began a journey that was on a Monday evening. By Wednesday afternoon, the head hematologist of that hospital came in and said, um, you have 30% blast cells, um, uh, leukemic cells, um, and told me basically I had a rare and aggressive form of leukemia. And um, we knew immediately we needed prayer. Seriously, we called 10 of our closest prayer circle friends, 10 to 12, asked them to be at the hospital within an hour, shut the door, and we prayed it out. <laughs> Because I didn't need to know why, but I needed to know how. <laughs> I was like, God, you don't need to tell me why I'm going through this, but you need to tell me how I'm going to get through this. And by the way, when he, the doctor told me I had leukemia, my first thought was, I have 15 years. And I'm claiming my 15 years. And so um, the doctor at that time told me, look, I need to get you to MD Anderson as soon as possible. I have another patient that I've been trying to get to MD Anderson. She's been waiting three days, and you do not have three days. If I can't get you out of here in 24 hours, you need to discharge and head there immediately. So within 24 hours, I was at MD Anderson. Within about 20 minutes of being at MD Anderson, as my family was coming in from out of town, in town, across the country, um, the doctor walked in and said, we'll let you know tonight if we're starting chemo, we're going to start testing. Um, I didn't start chemo that night, but they made it very clear to me that the next few days were going to be pretty much the craziest time I had ever seen. And no lie, I probably saw no less than 30 doctors, team members, had every test imaginable that you can imagine. What I didn't know now that I, we know now in reflecting, is that they were trying to beat the clock. They knew if I had a specific type of leukemia, I would qualify for a drug trial that had a protocol that I couldn't have had any other treatment before, right? But if they went ahead and started chemo, there was a strong chance I was going to die anyway. So they were beating the clock. And um, so Tuesday of the next week, I had my PA run into my room and said, we got your exact typing. We need you to sign here. We need you to roll over. We're going to give you, put chemo in your spinal cord, 
and my treatment began literally within 10 minutes of getting my exact typing. Um, fast forward that to say that um, I had, I was pretty much full time at MD Anderson for, I don't know, seven to nine months, um, having mon what we call monster rounds of chemo. Uh, my body quit responding to that chemotherapy and they knew I couldn't handle anymore. Um, and so they put me on maintenance chemo, which lasted two years. Um, but to be honest with you, the after effects of my cancer diagnosis have been pretty brutal over the years. Let me just share, um, at one point when my doctor came in, my chief oncologist, pretty much in the very beginning, I asked him how long I had been sick. He said a week, two at the very most. And um, so that's how quickly life can change. That picture you saw on the first was on that cruise and that is me the next week. And so uh, at one point my doctor looked at me and he said, Susan, I, I have over 500 patients. And not that I don't run into patients with complications because I do, but I don't run into patients with all the complications. And I'm only telling you that not to talk about myself, but talk about how good God is. I, I, let me just, I don't know if we have any medical or nurses in the room, do we? You know, let me just share some of the things I went through so you get an idea of how good this God is. Uh, I can't even tell you how many ambulance rides, ER visits I've had in my lifetime, but bacterial infection in my kidneys, my underlying congenital kidney disease popped up every time they took me to the point of my, my chemo regimen was that equivalent. The, the only one more intense would have been stem cell transplant. Um, I had coronavirus before there was such thing as COVID. They were like, Miss Nichols, you have the coronavirus. I'm like, what is that? Why do I get the weirdest things? I had ileus, pneumonia, RSV. I was in one of those bubbles in my room for several weeks where no one could come in my room unless they were in a full hazmat type suit. Um, chemical meningitis, which I didn't even know was a thing. Um, oh, and then Satan tried to take me out in a car wreck. They were like, Miss Nichols, don't you're going to be okay. And I'm like, uh-uh, uh-uh. I've been through leukemia. Satan has not taken me out in a car wreck. Um, uh, I had where they have, where you have blood coming out of your pores. I bleed, I bled out of every orifice of my body. My ears, my nose, I had bloods coming out of my scalp. I, I, I cried tears of blood. I fell and fractured my ribs. I can't tell you how many vacations we canceled or I had to fly home, leaving my family there, fly home, have someone pick me up and take me directly to MD Anderson. I had my gallbladder removed. I had the human meta pneumonia virus. I'm allergic to platelets and blood transfusions. I can't tell you the number of platelets and drug transfusions I had to have and I'm allergic to both. Um, I'm O negative which if that tells you anything, it's very rare to get my blood type. Um, I have neuropathy to this day. I'm numb from the waist down and in my arms. Um, the icing on the cake for me though, this may seem little, was when I went to my eye doctor and she said, Susan, the tears you produce aren't any good. And I'm like, okay, come on. Now I can't even produce the right tears to greet my diagnosis. So that will give you just an idea of some of the things that, that we went through in this. And now I want to share with you what I learned from all of this. Here's the one lesson I learned from this. Miracles are not about you, but they include you. Let me repeat that. Miracles are not about you but they include you. So I'm gonna walk through how I had to shift my mindset when God was clear with me with that spoken word about miracles over my life. 
so I knew that I had to redefine my definition of a miracle, right? So if we look up in a dictionary or if you're doing any um, research on miracles, the, the, the skim of it is, is that it's a welcomed or surprising event that's not explainable by science or nature, right? It's not explainable. And God said to me, yeah, parts of that are true, but let me tell you what a miracle is. A miracle is when Jesus enters. When Jesus enters your situation, Susan, that is when you're going to experience a miracle. So I had to take what I thought about all these miraculous things, and not saying they're not miraculous, but all the things on the outward appearance that seem miraculous, and understand that it went much deeper than that. That my miracle and our miracles are when Jesus enters our situation and walks with us. That is a miracle of God. When we hold on our faith, it doesn't always mean that the outcome is going to be what we want, right? I mean, we think sometimes, we kind of mix it a little bit with the prosperity theology sometimes in our mindset that because I'm good enough, because I've prayed enough, you know, because of this certain thing that I've experienced a miracle. And the truth is, throughout Scripture and throughout every day, people that experience a miracle don't always have a good outcome from the world's perspective. The outcome is not always what we want or expect. Let me give you a perfect example of that. If you'll turn with me, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Hebrews 11, 13, and 39. Now, y'all know that Hebrews is the wall of faith, the hall of faith that we talk about, of all these amazing people in Scripture that stayed faithful to God. In times of trial, you have people like Noah, Abraham, Sarah, um, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Rahab. I mean, people that faithfully serve God. And yet, I want you to look at verse 13 and 39. It says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Verse 39 says, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. They literally died without God fulfilling what he had promised to them in this lifetime. Right? So I had to change what faith and miracles looked like through that perception. Second thing I want to point out to you is that Miracles are not about us. Miracles are so God can be glorified. They are for his glory. Every time Jesus performed a miracle in scripture, you will see more times than not, the following scripture talks about how people went away glorifying God. Now here's Jesus, the sinless son of God, and people weren't attracted to him when he performed a miracle. They were connected and attracted to his father. Let me give you some examples of that. When Jesus handled the crippled woman on the Sabbath in Luke 13, 13, it says, Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Not Jesus who just touched her. God. Jesus raised the widow's son. In Luke 7, 16, it says they were all filled with awe and praised God. Jesus heals a paralyzed man in Matthew 9, 8. It says when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given authority to man. So God's whole purpose, Jesus' whole purpose was to glorify his father. We see this more poignantly in the blind man in John 9, 1 through 3. And it says, as he went along, he saw the blind man from earth. And Jesus' disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? 
Neither this man or his parents sinned, Jesus replied. But this happened so the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus knew his assignment to display his father, that even though he was the one doing the touching, doing the giving, being given the authority, that he and his purpose was to glorify his father. The next thing I learned is that miracles are meant for community. Look, God wants an audience. He's a God that likes an audience. He intends for miracles to include community. He wants maximum impact, right, for his touch. When a cancer victim reaches out, that is our most vulnerable time. It's a, we're usually at our worst, right? Physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, sometimes we're at our worst. And it's hard to reach out. And the one thing I noticed um, through this, I've, I've been a nonprofit my whole life, and I look at things through a lens of social justice and equity. That's just who I'm built to be. And... Um, when I looked around and I saw the health disparities, when I understood health deserts, when I understood how it would feel, even as a man, if he got diagnosed with breast cancer, that stigma that might be with that, what it's like to be elderly and have a barrier to communicating what's going on, or a child, or having a language barrier, in a country that's not familiar to you and the ins and outs of healthcare. I mean, you just learn all these different things. When you, when you understand spirit, when you're wrestling with your own theology, which I did, and you understand that there's this, uh, that sometimes receiving palatable care or even considering hospice even within the church, can seem like a lack of faith, right? And like you've given up on God. Um, and, and understanding, walking through these things, and what I realized is I had never felt so close to God in my whole life as I did walking through that. And what I realized was is my journey was not just for me. Uh, because of the role in my family, because of the role in my community, because my role with some fellow people in ministry and pastors, I knew what I was fixing to go through was going to be very public. And I didn't have the luxury of, of privacy. Um, and um, what made difference was my community. What I realized very shortly, it wasn't about me. That people, I, there was rarely a night, and again, I say three years, and my husband can attest, three years of heavy treatment, but up until about two years ago, every year had at least five to seven hospitalizations, right? So there is rarely a night in my treatment process I didn't have someone spending the night with me. There was rarely a time I didn't have pastor or pastors coming to visit me and pray over me. There is not a time that... Um, I kept purposely a picture of my family by my bedside because at a place like MD Anderson, you can get kind of lost in the shuffle, right? And I wanted my nurses to know I had a family. And I had, and I had kids. And I had responsibility. And I was having parent meetings with teachers from my hospital bed, right? I was still trying to figure out how to be a mom and a wife while I was in a bed. And so what I realized was that everybody I was in coming in contact with, it was about my community. It was about them seeing what God was doing through me and how I persevered and how I walked this journey was as important as the outcome of my journey, right? And so I learned that miracles were meant for community. We see this in Lazarus. In John 11, 43 through 45, it said, when he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. 
The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. And you want to know the first thing Jesus said? He said to the people standing watching that miracle, take off his grave clothes. They participated in his healing. Jesus performed the miracle, but they were there to unravel him. His community helped free him up. It was not just, Jesus wanted everybody to have a front row seat to what was happening. The next thing I learned is that miracles include us. God wants you to be a part of someone's miracle. He wants you to experience a front row seat. Miracles can be very practical to the people that you're serving, but extraordinarily to others. My, I can name two things that presented a huge miracle in my life, and y'all are going to get a kick out of this. First of all was my Wi-Fi crock pot. While I was in the hospital, I had a 10-year-old and 11-year-old. My son actually had his 12th birthday party at MD Anderson. And they were at an age where they weren't quite old enough to be left alone a lot. They, you know, they were overnight latchkey kids for the most part. Um, and I had this crock pot that I could tell my kids what to put in it in the morning. And from my hospital bed, I could turn it on and they would come home to a warm meal. Praise God for Wi-Fi. The other thing was um, there were weeks, and sometimes I didn't see my kids but once, for a, once a week. We tried to keep their lives as normal as possible. And um, when my family made sure I got an iPad so I could FaceTime my kids, so I could be, so a friend could film and, show me what they were doing at a live event that I couldn't participate in. I tell people I watched my kids grow up through pictures and videos, and I did. Really, at the formative years, that's exactly what happened. But that was a miracle to me, those practical things. The practical thing of you taking a meal or driving someone to their treatment, or God bless the ministry of presence. That's a miracle to somebody else. You are an answer to their prayers. I, I lost my mom when I was young. And um, I grew up in a very um, dysfunctional family. And I got to just really confess that probably not a single day of my life has gone by that I've missed my mother. It was that bad. Left home at 16. Best decision of my life saved my life. And um, one day, though, I was sitting in bed going, God, I wish this is one moment. I wish I had a mom. I wish I had someone to walk in and nurture me. No more than 10 minutes later, a dear woman in my life who I do consider like a mom walked in the door and she said, I don't know why I was so prompted to come in today but I just needed to see you. Oh, that is so God. I can tell you stories like that. I can tell you stories where nurses walked in my room and they said, we, we can't, exp literally, we can't explain it. We don't know why you're alive. Literally, this came out of nurse's mouth. We don't know why you're alive. There were times where my husband and my children were told pretty much to, to say they're, goodbyes. They didn't know if I was going to live through the night, particularly on one occasion. And um, I, uh, you know, I knew I wasn't going to die, but I wanted to die. If I could be really honest with you. I remember looking at my husband and said, just let Jesus take me. I'm good. I trust him with you. I trust him with my kids. Just let me go. I can't do this anymore. It's too much. 
And yet it's why I'm here, I can't explain, except for a miracle of God. And the fact that, the fact that I knew that those miracles included the people around me. I knew the little practical things they were doing were what was sustaining me. The last thing, we see this, I want to point this out. We see this with the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, 33 through 35. It says, but a Samaritan he traveled came where the man was, and he saw him and he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring his own oil and wine, and he put on the man his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, told him to look after him and said, when I return, I'll pay any extra expenses. All he did was practical stuff. He practically, in a very practical way, loved on someone else. Someone else that was an enemy. And what that proved is the miracles of God through that act of kindness. The last thing that I learned is that we're all made to be a part of miracles. That is why you're made. You are made for a kingdom purpose. You know, heaven is described in scripture as a new Jerusalem, as a city. You know, so many times, you think about death a lot when you're dying. I mean, I'm just being real with you. You know, you sit in bed and you're like, okay, so what's heaven like today? Because this isn't going so hot, right? And you think about it. And in our theology growing up, at least in the theology growing up in my life, you think, oh, I'm going to be in heaven. I'm just going to be singing all day on clouds and just hanging out. But yet, when we read Revelation, it's described as a city. We're going to have buildings. We're going to have homes. We're going to have streets. We're going to have jobs. Your life and what the earth should look like perfected is what we're going to experience in heaven. This is our practice ground. Earth is a reflection of of what heaven should be like. Or maybe I said that wrong. Heaven's a reflection of what earth should be like, but you see what I'm saying. It's going to be a place, a physical place, with, with redeemed people, right? Here's the amazing thing of all this. We have a chance on this earth, in this life, to have a practice time. We get to practice and see glimpses and experience of what our heavenly life will be like. Right? So let's look at Matthew 6 2. It says, So when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received the reward in full. So it's talking about in this scripture how we're to help others, how we're to show this practical love to others in our lives. And later in that same chapter, he teaches us how to say the Lord's Prayer. And what does it say in there? Let your kingdom come, let your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Like we are to have that imminent reflection in our lives daily of what it's like to be in heaven. And what a blessing to experience that. So here's what I learned. I had to redefine what a miracle looked like to me. I needed to realize miracles were not about me. But they were meant for community. That it would include me. It would affect every aspect of every part of my life. Even now, I have to, anything I commit to, anything I do, I have this health lens that I filter things through. Not because... I'm limiting what God's doing, but because my reality is 
I have to honor God with my body, with my service, with my time, with my energy to do what he's called me to do. And that we and you, all of us are made to be a part of miracles. Our lives are not about us. They're not about us. We're kingdom people. And in a kingdom view of things, we're not limited by space, by socioeconomics, by race, by politics. Those things, believe me, I understand the reality. But the truth is, when people say, which side are we on, we have to say, God's side. We're here to honor our Father. We're here. Our, our personal lens, our cultural lens, God knows all that. He placed us in a certain time in history, in a certain family that worships a certain way, certain color, at a certain socioeconomic status. He gets it. He made every part of us. But when that trumps our view of the kingdom, we are out of bounds. We are to look at all those things in our personal life, how we're made up, everything that we do, and in our cultural spheres of influence and everything that makes them up uniquely. And we're to say, God honors those things, but how are we using those things to honor him? That's the viewpoint we're to have. And that's when we see miracles, when we can do that, when we can supersede our individual experiences, when we can supersede our cultural experiences and say, I want this to be a kingdom experience for the greater good, for the kingdom, for God's glory. When you want that more than anything, that's when we get the glimpses of heaven on earth. Man, I just... I pray that because when we start getting glimpses of that and start experiencing that, boy, you want it more, right? It's, it's a good thing. You, you, you see what really honors God. So again, I just encourage you to seize your opportunity to be a part of a miracle. And that includes every aspect of your life, your time, your talents, your finances, Every aspect of your life, God didn't just ask for 10% or a part of us. He asked for all of us. And so that means staying focused on what that looks like. So let me close our time in prayer. God, I just thank you. Again, I do thank you for this opportunity. It's just a miracle that I'm, that any of us, God, I mean, we all deserve an earthly death and Lord we also know that that's just a reality for all of us Lord we're all going to die but yet how are we going to use this time to glorify you and to practice being in your presence in a very tangible way when we get to heaven and Lord I just pray that you keep us focused on that that you would keep us reminded that God it, the journey's not easy it's probably not going to have the outcomes we want sometimes. Lord, but your outcome is so much better. Lord, help us to suffer well. That's one thing I think we've lost in the church today is how to suffer well. Because life is full of suffering and it is hard. But Lord, we want you to enter. We want our miracle to be that we are constant understanding that we're walking through with you all the things that you've built us and designed and purposed for our lives. In Christ's name, amen.
let the church say amen. I want to make sure that we open the doors of the church, open up the altar for prayer. One specific ask. Do you desire to be a part of a miracle? Do you desire to be a part of a miracle? Do you want the Lord of heaven to manifest through you whatever it is that he desires to manifest through you? Are you ready for a miracle? Are you ready to be an open conduit of God's love? The first thing that we want to make sure you do, we can't do it without Jesus. Jesus is the major player in any and every miracle. If you never had an opportunity to invite him in your heart, to invite him to lead your heart, to invite him to, uh, to, to, to reinvent your heart, I want to encourage you to do so now. Uh, I want you to, at your seats uh, or at the altar or however, whatever posture you need to take, I want you to capture these moments just a moment so we can center on him. The doors of the church are open. The, the altar is open for prayer. Let us move toward the place where God wants us to be. My father is omnipotent and this you can't deny a God of might and miracles Tis written in the sky. The Bible tells us of his love and wisdom always through. And every little bird or flower are testimonies to. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. It took a miracle to hang the moon in the sky. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it was a miracle of love and grace. It took a miracle to hang the stars in space. It took a miracle to hang the world in place. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it was a miracle. It was a miracle of love and grace. It took a miracle to hang the stars in space. It took a miracle to hang the world in place. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it was a miracle of love and grace.
let the church say amen. I want to encourage you uh, for all of the survivors and all of those who are, uh, are, who are uh, caregivers, we have a, a, a special light for you. Uh, we'll make sure we provide that to you before you leave. We want to encourage you also uh, to, to take part in some, uh, some, some vegan cake and uh, some uh, with vegan icing in, in, in some fresh uh, water that's good for your soul. Uh, so we invite you to partake in the fellowship in the fellowship hall after the service. On the back of the program, you'll see a lot of uh, announcements there. We do want to make sure you have an opportunity to, uh, to, to look at those. Uh, uh, how many of you are already voted already? Uh, amen, amen. Well, I, I, I voted, but I, I, I have to get my mom uh, to, the, to the polls. And so w uh, I'll raise my hands for her as well. I want to encourage everyone to fully participate in the early voting and also uh, on the back of the program, if you see, uh, know of someone who has needs, let them know uh, Metro will get you there uh, uh, free. We want to make sure that we uh, remove all the excuses that people may have so that everybody can have an opportunity to vote. Amen. We do uh, look forward to uh, next week. Uh, we have an opportunity to uh, celebrate All Saints Sunday. Uh, we want to extend uh, in that invitation uh, for those. We, we know several people who are from the church body who have gone on to the church triumphant, but we also know that many of you have, may have family and friends that may have passed in the last year, and we want to capture that, but we, we need your help to do that. Uh, please uh, reach out to the church office uh, so that we can get that information and also get uh, images so we can honor uh, your loved one. Amen. Uh, we, we also uh, look forward to uh, seeing uh, uh, some, some men and women. We have several Bible studies that's going on online. I want to invite you to one for the men that's coming up uh, in, in the beginning of November, uh, Better, Ma uh, Better Man. I want to encourage you to be a part of that. You can sign up on the uh, QR code uh, that's on the back of the bulletin. Amen. Before we uh, uh, have uh, celebrate the, oh, oh, I want to make sure that uh, the women, the women, uh, uh, the, the the women's study is. I surrender all, uh, please. I uh, don't want to uh, uh, miss out on the, the women. Uh, you want to you capture the end of this series. Uh, and if you haven't been a part of any of those early morning, uh, you're missing a lot. We want to encourage you to fully take part. Amen? Uh, we want to make sure we invite our... SPRC chair to come and he has a, uh, a special announcement. Good morning. First, I'd like to say uh, thank you for that wonderful message, Dr. Nichols. It was very inspiring. Um, I won't be complaining about too many things anymore. Uh, I just want to take a minute to uh, remind everyone that this is the last Sunday of Pastor Appreciation Month. Um, so let's make sure that we show our pastor that we appreciate him. Uh, pastor Ed will be celebrating 30 years of ministry this year. The last seven of which have been right here at Trinity. And uh, hasn't always been smooth sailing. Uh, we've had to navigate, as a church, we've had to navigate through some stormy weather. But uh, thank God that Pastor Ed has always found uh, new and creative ways to get us to the other side. 
So, uh, so let's make sure that we take care of our pastor by way of a monetary gift, uh, any amount that you feel on your heart and you can afford to give would be appreciated. There are uh, several ways that you can go about doing that. Uh, you can use the uh, envelope on the back of your pew and just label it, label it as such, ask for appreciation. Uh, you can give online on the Trinity website, and you can also use the cash app. So let's show up, let's show out like our Houston, Texas, and take care of our pastor. Amen. Yes, uh, thank you, Johnny, for um, the prayers that you are lifting up for my team, uh, the Cowboys. Yes, I, I do receive your prayer. Uh, and I do want to also uh, make sure uh, we know that uh, Pastor Hilda has, uh, uh, has given a lot of leadership to the body in uh, though she may be absent physically, you can best believe she's online and she's going to be evaluating everything that we do. And so want to make sure we do our best to uh, honor her as well. W whatever you do, if you're doing something online, please make sure you provide all your information so we can capture that information as well. Let's, let's give a hand praise for our financial secretary. Good morning. I will leave the pastor appreciation online information up until All Saints Sunday. So I'll leave it an extra week so you can be able to get that, your, your donations in. Thank you. Amen. Amen. All right. May, may the collection stewards come. Lord, we thank you for giving us opportunity to come together today. Father, thank you for uh, the word that has gone forth. Father, we thank you for the wisdom, the testimony, the heart. Lord, we ask that you uh, supernaturally allow those seeds to be planted in our hearts. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to participate in this, the sharing of your tithe in our offerings, Lord. We we know they will be used for the building of your kingdom through uh, Trinity United Methodist Church as we uh, seek to glorify Jesus Christ all over this world. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I'm expecting great things. I'm expecting great things.
do great things in my home. You do great things all around. You do great things. Eyes have not seen and I choose to believe in great things. Amen, 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 amen. 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 What a blessed morning. What a great, great morning. Um, to Susan, we have a token for you, a gift for you, and we just appreciate you. Your message was a delight, a joy, a shifting. <coughs> thank you for sharing your testimony, and thank you for sharing the word of God with us this morning. Thank you. Robert, 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 here's your light. Thank you for being a great caregiver. Yes. I, I have one. I know, I know, I know. Thank you so much. Amen. This is really hard. <laughs> you want to get my, uh, my thingamajig, right? Uh, before we leave, I do want to make sure, I uh, want to keep in prayer some of the folk who, who are not with us. We know uh, some loved ones who uh, have had accidents and those. Please look on, on the back of the program. Put your hand on those and pray for those. I uh, want to cover all those. We want to make sure we uh, keep you uh, lifted up. Uh, those online, we thank you uh, for being here. Uh, uh, for our first-time guests, I want to ask uh, if we have a first-time guest uh, with us uh, today, uh, please stand. We want to uh, honor you with a gift. Uh, uh, we, we are so grateful for your presence. Uh, it looked like we're all family here. Oh, oh, Veronica. Veronica, thank you for being here. Uh, uh, Y'all just don't know the... the it's like the, the, the spirit of uh, Veronica is such a blessing to all of us. And one day, you will have an opportunity to taste the foretaste of something that she put her hands on. I'm not going to share too much because I don't want to share. Uh, so let me, let me just stop right there. Uh, but please, let, let's show some love to Veronica. Let's, let's stand and greet at least six people that we don't know. Let them know that, that you love them and there's nothing that they can do about it. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost be with you both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. For he is good. For he is good. For he is good. 